Welcome back. In this episode, we are going to tackle this horrendous keyboard, corroded, dirty, not working, and we are going to try and make it look something like this. But that will be later, because I'm going to start with the restoration of the tape cassette recorder first. And when I pulled it out, that's what I was met with. What is that? What is that alien? <laughs> that, that's a, a mutant. <laughs> I know what that is. That, that's just solder wick that was soldered into a scratched uh, ground plane or ground copper area as part of the myriad modifications the previous owner uh, tried to do in this machine. Uh, on the good side, uh, the drive belt was pristine. It was working perfectly. Uh, the elasticity was just as if it were new. This is a very high quality drive belt. I don't have a replacement from China that is as good, so I'm considering leaving it there, but I'll take this decision later. First thing first, um, first things first, uh, I need to take out um, the tape mechanism uh, the, 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 from, from the front part or the top part uh, of the case, this plastic uh, case which I will clean separately. There it is. I will clean this one separately. It's no big deal, it's just plastic. And, uh, and then remove that mutant uh, from there, which is not a big deal. Just uh, reflow the solder and pull it out. I forgot one little part up there. But notice that one of the pads on the center top uh, has been removed by the previous owner, uh, the scratched area on the ground, copper area, it's not fully uh, covered by solder, so we need to remove all of that old solder, all of that old flux, and redo that connection to the missing pad. So first things first, again, removing the old solder uh, with solder wick and new flux to pull out all the corrosion, all the grime, all the dirt from there as well. That's what flux does, rosin, which is the main part of flux. That's what it does when it's activated at high temperatures. Once all of that is sort of pulled from the metal, I can use just Kim Wipe, which is ESD safe. And the photo I took is this photo. You can see that the scratched area is not fully covered uh, with solder and the removed pad is more clearly visible now, so that it at least is clean. But I was talking about uh, Kim Wipe. Um, I use uh, the one I use is Kimtech Science Precision Wipes. They are ESD safe and they don't tear. Uh, once you scrub on them. So they're very handy for this kind of job. So now I'm redoing that uh, uh, joint um, from little exposed part of a trace to the lead of a component, the missing pad uh, area. I checked electrically and visually, everything is okay. And now I'm recoating that scratched area uh, with solder and removing the excess with a, a solder wick. Somebody asked me what solder wick I use. I use super wick number 453 fine braid. And then as a, the last step, I use just some Sharpies, green Sharpies to put an extra layer of protection and make it look cleaner as well. So now the board can partly come off if I, if I remove um, uh, the cable ties that were holding the cables together. I don't need to remove the board completely, I just want to have access to the electrolytic capacitors, but first I cut some of more of that mod wiring that was there, and I closed the uh, hole that was left to avoid humidity and dust getting in. So now I'm pulling uh, the electrolytic capacitors, cleaning the board while I have access to it, opening the holes uh, on the pads with the solder wick because I'm not using any desoldering pump for a delicate job like this. So the new capacitor goes in, and I solder it back in place. There are three electrolytic capacitors that I'm going to change in this way without using any soldering pump. I just heat the leads, pull it out, use solder wick to open the pads and put the new one uh, in. Sorry that the a fumes extractor uh, is on the way, but I always use a <laughs> fumes extractor. So same procedure, opening the pads with solder wick, putting the new capacitor in there, uh, observing polarity. These are all electrolytics, they are not bipolar. 
soldering it, soldering it back in place. Um, every time I am slightly in doubt whether I created a short or whether I made the proper connection, um, I use a multimeter in continuity mode to check it, and this will be one of those times. I will pull out the multimeter and check that the connections are there that should be there and no short circuits. This is the final electrolytic capacitor. The fumes extractor will be on the way, but I'm putting the new one in there, although you can't see it. And I'm just soldering it, soldering it now. So three uh, electrolytics and a little restoration of the board because of the mess the previous owner did with his myriad modifications. Goodness knows what those modifications were. So I'm dusting it now with an ESD safe air blower. Uh, now I'm facing the decision, do I change the, the drive belt or not? And my Chinese <laughs> replacements are not as good, so I decided not to change it. I'm just going to clean the cogs and wheels instead, so the, the drive belt the, the, doesn't slide on them. Uh, because otherwise there wouldn't be any rotation. Once that's done and I have an opportunity, I lubricate the mechanisms on the bottom side with WD-40 uh, anti-friction. And then I just screw that uh, electronics board back in place, freed from all the alien beings and mutants uh, that were in it. And of course I have to put the little cable ties back together for neatness. Now, um, the drive belt for the counter I did remove. It didn't look as good clearly made in a different way, so I'll put a brand new replacement. And now it's just a long process of cleaning the entire mechanism with you know, cotton swabs and, uh, and IPA, 99% IPA. The most important parts to clean um, are the things that actually touch the tape. So the, the read-write heads and uh, that little wheel I'm cleaning right now that gets very dirty, touches the tape, so I spend uh, quite a bit of time, loads of cotton swabs to clean that properly. Look at the cotton swabs spread there, <laughs> that are accumulating there. Another dusting with my ESD safe air blower. Now oh, I'm finally cleaning the head. And again cleaning that little wheel. And I'm lubricating the counter which luckily is working, otherwise I would need to 3D print new parts, but it's working, just needed to be cleaned and lubricated. I'm putting the new drive belt for the counter, testing that it's working. At this point, uh, I'm just sanitizing the buttons, because that's the part we touch with our hands. So this is not really for it to look good yet, that part's still coming, I'm just sanitizing them, you know, removing the grime and, and sterilizing them with IPA. A little, a little more lubrication with WD-40 uh, anti-friction, so everything move, moves smoothly, the entire mechanism. Removing the excess with some more um, cotton swabs. And now we are probably ready for the more cosmetic, cosmetic part, except that I need to clean the connector. After having cleaned everything, missing the connector would be a real pity. So for the cosmetic part, I'm using this car product. Uh, it really makes blacks uh, uh, shine again. You know, uh, um, black plastics come back to life, to life with this thing. So I, I like to use it. You probably have seen me use it before in other restorations. The result is very gratifying. Look at how it looks. It's almost like brand new, it just came out of the factory. <laughs> and it works too! I'm particularly happy that the counter works, because if that was broken, that's one of the more uh, annoying parts uh, to fix, because of the unavailability of replacements. And I'm giving a final test uh, of the mechanisms. Everything's fine, everything is, uh, is working. Um, I'm not too happy about that hole on top of the motor, but it's it's dealt with, it will be hidden anyway. So I'm quite satisfied with uh, this result. So we can move on to the more dramatic part, this thing. Um, there is everything there, not only corrosion, but there is residues of 
old sugary drinks, some form of cola, you can feel the stickiness of the sugar. There are spiders, there is lint, there is dust, goodness knows everything that is uh, in this. Um, I partly already removed the keycaps. Each keycap has two components, uh, the keycap itself and this little translucent uh, protection on top. They are far from translucent right now, uh, but we can bring them back to life as well. But let's take it one step at a time. I cannot evaluate the corrosion with the key switches soldered to the, to the board on the back. And I'm not going to run the risk of leaving loads of corrosion in there. So I will, and I am, desoldering every key switch. I think there are 72 or 73 of them. It is worth the effort. I see a lot of hobbyists not doing this because they get intimidated with the amount of work. It takes a while, but it's easy stuff. You just put flux, you reflow all the solder joints. They are very large, very easy to desolder. And you just go into a kind of autopilot, a kind of meditative mode. I was in autopilot I have, as I was doing this, so much so that I disordered every shunt that uh, forms the, the columns of the keyboard matrix, which I didn't need to disorder at all, but I was in such an autopilot mode that I just, just disordered everything. <laughs> and when I, when I realized what I was doing, I had done it already. It was at the end. It is worth it to do this. Don't leave that corrosion behind. If it took 44 years for the corrosion to get to this point, it takes another 10 years for it to, to, to be twice as bad. Because the more corrosion there is, the faster it goes. So you see, if you do it right, by reflowing with new flux first and then desoldering it. It takes a little while. You go into that pilot, it takes a little while, but it's faster than you think. And then at the end, if you've done it right, and I'm, I'm not cutting this, this is a single shot. If you did it right, you just lift it. You just lift it from the key switches. Um, and now you can evaluate what's going on. Now you know what's happening there and you can take the right actions uh, to restore the thing instead of just, you know, uh, trying to do it with the key switches so that it's impossible to do that. There will be corrosion left underneath the key switches, stuff that you can't see, you, 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 you can't send it, you can't treat it with, with a, um, a rust converter properly. It is worthwhile to do this. Now I'm cleaning uh, the keyboard electronics board first uh, to prepare it for what's going to happen next. And I pull out all the key switches with, with uh, tweezers, very easy. And then for every switch, I test them. I test to see the resistance when a switch is pressed. And you see there about 51 ohms. That's not good enough. You know, you, we all know that 350 is not good enough, but 50 is not good enough. So in proof that I'm using the Oxid D100, not D5. D5 is flush action. It doesn't make sense to use D5 in a confined space, like inside a key switch, because it's not going to flush the grime out. Uh, D100 does not have the solvents of D5. It goes easier on plastic, and it improves the electric connection without needing the flush action, which you cannot get real flush action in a confined, sealed thing like a key switch. So I just squirt it a little bit um, on the the, the little cracks around uh, um, the, uh, the um, how to say the plunger as they call it, and uh, and, and that's enough. This this can of D100 has a, a, um, a it, if you keep pressing it, it it, it doesn't squirt more. It's a, a single squirt action, which is precisely what we need for that. And look, less than one ohm. So I wanted to see every key switch registering less than one ohm when I pressed it. So I did it for all 72 or 73. Um, I think this is the way to do it. Use the Oxy D100 and Ox not D5. D5 is for sockets when you are, you know, when you can flush things out, not a confined space like a key switch, which is sensitive to solvents as well. So I've done it for all of them, trust me. And now the keycaps, I just put them in a warm, bath with floor cleaner and an oxidizing agent to try to reduce that, uh, that coloration or that discoloration, that darkening um, of, the, of the, um, yeah, the acrylic. 
Now, this is the exposed metal plate of the keyboard. It's extremely corroded, you see. You couldn't see that with the key switches in place. And imagine my leaving this behind. Some of these corrosion points have deep pitting. Um, they would, this would get a lot worse very quickly if I wouldn't handle that. So it was worth doing this. The way to, to proceed now is to sand this corrosion down and remove the pitting. Uh, in two cases, the pitting was so deep that I couldn't remove that with uh, power tools. Um, so I, I addressed that with a rust converter. Um, the metal is very thick, so you're not going to lose material by sanding it deeply like this. That's one of the areas of deep pitting that I couldn't really sand away. Um, you can notice as well that there is a lot of metal left. It's a very thick plate, so it's no problem to sand it. So to address the pitting and to protect the entire plate, I'm going to use this rust converter. This is a Dutch version. I, they, cer they certainly are equivalent in whatever country you're, you're in. So I apply it first to the more you know, sensitive pitting areas, like that one there that uh, my partner is trying to focus on. That's where I start. But I, I cover it, the, the entire plate I cover with, with a liberal layer of a uh, um, rust converter and I leave it um, acting overnight. Actually for a whole day I left the rust converter there doing its job. And at the end you just sand it by hand lightly to prepare it for priming and this is what it looks like after you've sanded it. All these darkened, these purplish areas this is uh, the protection layer that you get, and the rust is converted into an inert material. So now I just prime it, two layers, with a light grey primer. This is more white than grey, but they call it <laughs> light grey uh, primer. For me it's a pleasure to do this. I am wearing a mask to protect myself from the solvents uh, in the spray can. Uh, that's why you might hear some Darth Vader-like breathing sounds if you pay attention. <laughs> And then two coats of uh, black paint. And I finish up with two coats of uh, uh, varnish. But I didn't show that part. This is just uh, the end result. It's not perfect, um, but it's light years better um, than what it was. And, and this will last at least another 44 years easily. Uh, more, because it's better than the original. Now I am reflowing um, uh, the wire solder joints for the keyboard um, because I, I really don't want this keyboard to have any problem and I'm checking for short circuits between neighboring soldering joints and checking for continuity with the keyboard connector so I can apply some hot glue to relieve uh, whatever mechanical strain there must be on those wires. Now I am soldering again uh, the wire shunts that form the columns of the keyboard matrix, that those things I desoldered uh, unnecessarily because I was in an autopilot mode in some kind of deep meditation. <laughs> but it's okay because it gives me the opportunity to do that again with brand new solder. I'm using lead-free solder for this and then the result will be better uh, than, than the original. So. Uh, a distraction. I, sh I didn't need to do this, but uh, since I did, it's good. And I'm checking for continuity uh, along all the columns to make sure everything is working. And it is. So this is ready. Uh, now I'm putting the treated key switches, treated and tested. They have been tested offline with the multimeter to make sure that all of them are conducting when pressed and not conducting when not pressed. Took a long while to put them all back in. But uh, yeah, it's gratifying to see this result compared to how we started. And it's not only that it looks good, I mean, nobody will probably see that, but it will last long. So now we can just put the electronics board on top of the key switches, everything lines up perfectly. It's a matter of soldering it all back without any fear, because I've tested everything offline with the multimeter in conti continuity mode. So there is no anxiety left about, well, am I soldering something back that I will need to desolder again if it doesn't work. No, 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 everything works. <laughs> uh, everything is being tested. It's a lot of work, uh, but it's very easy and you're, you're, you're gratified with a result like this. I don't have those translucent caps on top. Uh, as you might recall, they are not translucent anymore at all. So it, it's 
looking very nice because we don't have those caps, but the, the, those caps can be treated, and I will show you how to treat them. Also very easy. This is so easy to achieve, this result. It, 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 it's a lot of work, it's laborious, but there is no difficulty involved. So to treat those transparent acrylic keycaps, I'm using 303 protectant. It doesn't only protect against UV light, it also rehydrates the plastic and recovers some of that translucence uh, that was there. And if at the, after you left them soaking in that for a while, you have to rub each one of them um, with a cloth. And as you can see there, look, they are completely translucent um, again. Um, th th this result is better than I expected for this particular keyboard. The only thing that betrays that it's not a brand, brand new keyboard is a few cracks on the acrylic caps. But other than that, look at that. It like it, it's like it just walked out of the factory line. So this is it for this episode. The result was gratifying to me. I hope it was gratifying to you as well. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Next time, uh, I'm going to address the case, the case that has a thousand and one holes drilled in it by that uh, obsessive mother that was the previous owner. I'm going to bring all that back to uh, original condition, so stay tuned for that. I will see you soon. In the meantime, take care.